Okay, so first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me the, um, the opportunity to present some recent work on the characterization and on the structuring role of bone mineral surface layer. So uh, that uh, work is a common, let's say, effort of two groups from a lab. Uh, our group, we are spectroscopists and we are using spectroscopic technique to characterize some uh, hybrid materials. And another group which is centered around the study of uh, biomineralization processes and tissue engineering. So and the result that we'll show correspond to the, the work of two uh, PhD students, uh, Yan Wang and uh, Stanislas Bonnev. So today I will talk about bone. Uh, we heard about bone uh, this morning. And uh, you know that bone is an hybrid, rather complex organic and inorganic materials. Here are the components of bone, appetite crystals, collagen fibrils, water, numerous non-collagenous proteins, of course, uh, other small molecules and cells. So I will focus my talk so on the bone mineral. Uh, here you can see some extracted bone mineral crystals. So you see that there are nanometric platelets with the small size. Uh, the composition is rather close to a stoichiometric hydroxyapatite. We heard about that this morning. But uh, contrary to the stoichiometric phase, you have a, a, a lot of, of substitutions, in particular uh, carbonate ions, hydrogen phosphate ions, and as a consequence, you have a calcium deficiency in order to keep the uh, electron neutrality of the, of the mineral. So now let's talk about the specific association of, the, of the, the minerals phase and the organic phase in bone. So it's very specific because the organic phase, the collagen molecules, the triple helix, they assemble into fibrils and then the fibrils are mineralized. But they are mineralized in such a way that you observe a co-alignment of the C-axis, the crystallographic axis of the, of the, of the platelets, between the platelets and also between the platelets and the main axis of the collagen fibers that gives the, 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 the specific association of the uh, in bone and, uh, and specific uh, uh, mechanical properties. So, and that association is supposed to be driven by the organomineral interface. And concerning that interface, you have, let's say, several scenarios in the literature, several actors. Some people think that the collagen fibrils are in direct contact with the, with, the, with the particles, which is quite old concept, but still relevant today. There's a lot of work, uh, of course, on the non-collagenous proteins, on their functions. So we heard about osteocalcin, the MP1, but also glycosaminoglycan and also citrate ions. So these, these species are supposed to control the nucleation, the growth, and so the three-dimensional association of the, of the mineral with the with the organic phase. And there is also a third component, water. And there are some authors that propose that water, and in particular, of course, confined water, could make the link between the organic, so the collagen fibrils, and the mineral platelets. But also in between some adjacent mineral platelets. OK, so meaning that the water should have, let's say, a specific affinity with the surface of the mineral platelets. And concerning that platelets, the, the, the surface of the, of the bone mineral, so Christelle Combe um, talked about that this morning, so the surface domain is proposed to be, let's say, quite distinct from the bulk. So it's a quite old concept, actually. So the first paper was in the, in the late 50s, and there are some now recent, let's say, uh, experiment, recent papers, dealing either with biological appetite and also biomimetic appetite. So the data are rather sparse, but actually the, 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 the common feature that merged from that data is that the surface domain would be very disordered, highly disordered and highly hydrated. So we actually we decided to reinvestigate the, 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 the surface domain of the bone mineral using one particular technique, which is solid state nuclear magnetic <coughs> resonance. So why using that technique? Um, maybe the first reason is because we can deal with that technique with intact samples. So in the case of bone, for instance, uh, we use samples 
um, um, directly uh, extracted from a, a living animal and studied the sample just two hours maximum after the extraction. So it means that we can uh, 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 handle bone in its native hydration state, so without any chemical treatment. So it means that we do not alter the surface or alter the mineral. So we put the sample in the sample holder, the rotors, put in the spectrometer, spun at the magic angle in order to get some high resolution spectra. So um, solid state NMR is uh, particularly relevant in the, in the field of biomineralization. <coughs> Maybe the main reason is the fact that you can choose the nucleus that you want to observe. And by choosing the nucleus, you can selectively look at the organic part with the carbon, for instance, or looking at the mineral part with the phosphorus. And you get information on what? The chemical environment through the chemical shift, but also on spatial proximities, so short range or long range by studying dipolar couplings or spin diffusion phenomenon. So as an example, with that technique, you can distinguish all the um, polymorphs of the calcium phosphate phase, apatite, bushite, monetite, for instance. <coughs> and the number of resonance that you get corresponds to the number of uh, independent crystallographic uh, uh, sites that you have in the structure. So you can run also 2D experiments. Uh, and then you can correlate the phosphorus spectrum to the proton spectrum, for instance, in the case of hydroxyapatite. And the correlation uh, resonance that you get gives you information on the proximities on the, two, um, on the two ions in the structure. So one crystallographic site for the phosphorus in close proximity to the unique uh, crystallographic site for the hydroxyls. Okay. So that was for stoichiometric apatite. Uh, so that's a good starting point, a reference, let's say, sample. Let's now compare to bone, intact bone, so that's what we get. One single resonance, a little bit shifted uh, compared to the stoichiometric one, you, uh, with, a, let's say, a, 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 higher, a bigger line width, which is due to the local disorder around the phosphate ions in the structure. And now if we run, if we run a two-dimensional experiment, instead of one site, we get two resonances instead of one. So the first one here, uh, let's say, is in a way some quite similar to the one that we get for stoichiometric appetite because we have some phosphate that are correlating with, with hydroxyl group with a, a specific uh, uh, chemical shift at zero ppm. So that's no doubt that with this, and a second group of phosphate, second domain, same chemical shift but a little bit larger, uh, correlating with water molecules. <coughs> okay. So we can prove it is water molecules because we can follow the dehydration <coughs> of the sample, and if we dehydrate, we see the disappearance of that uh, resonance, and then we reveal some hydrogen phosphate groups here. <coughs> I will talk about that later. And you see that the, 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 the phosphate in the apatitic uh, uh, environment are not modified upon the dehydration. So we can show also that the water molecules are in an accessible environment, let's say, by doing some exchange bet um, between water and deuterated water. And after a certain time, you remove the peak corresponding to the, the water molecules. And there is no modification concerning the phosphate in the apatitic environment. So it means that we are able to reveal two different environments, the apatitic phase and an accessible hydrophilic domain, let's say. We can also quantify this domain and we are around 50-50. So one might say, okay, you show us that there is some water around, probably, or at least near some phosphate. That sounds obvious because you deal with uh, an hydrated sample. Yes, that's right. But it's not so easy because if you are looking at still the stoichiometric appetite, it's still nanoparticles. Okay, it's nanorods. It's not exactly platelet, but anyway, with a high uh, specific surface area. You wet the samples, you run the same experiment, you don't see any strong adsorption of water molecules. On the contrary, if we now we are looking at biomimetic appetite, 
so synthetic, directly precipitated from a simulated body fluid. So the same characteristics as the bone mineral, so platelets, a uh, high carbonate content, the presence of, a, of, a, of the outer domain, then you do see a strong adsorption. And the behavior upon, let's say, hydration dehydration is, you can see, quite similar with the, with the, the, the bone mineral. So meaning that the, that the hydrophilic, let's say, character of the bone mineral is depending on that specific domain and is not really related to uh, um, the presence or the adsorption of organ uh, organic molecules because in the case of biomimetic hepatite we don't need, uh, for the synthesis, we don't use some uh, uh, organic additives. So we investigated also the, let's say, the chemical nature of the surface because there is two, let's say, two um, main propositions in the literature concerning the, 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 the chemical nature. Uh, some people propose that it is related to an amorphous calcium phosphate, other people to an octa calcium phosphate, and Christelle told, told, um, told us about that. And a, a recent model proposed that actually it would be a disordered octa calcium phosphate phase linked by some citrate ions. Well, that sounds weird for us, so we decided to uh, investigate directly a synthetic ACP. So synthesized in a pH range where we maximize <coughs> the presence of hydrogen phosphate ions. So we, we end up with this kind of particles, tiny particles, let's say shapeless. And uh, if you now we are analyzing by an amount this, uh, this sample, we see the same, let's say, characteristics in terms of position of the, of the resonance, the phosphorus resonance. In terms also of uh, uh, line widths, it's quite similar, but more importantly, the same behavior upon hydration. So we do absorb also a large quantity of water. So for us, it's no doubt that probably we are close to a, an, ac, um, an amorphous calcium phosphate phase rather than a, a, an octa calcium. So another problem that we have to, 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 to face is the, um, the fact that um, we wanted to prove, let's say, that, that the, the, the surface domain re was in the continuity of the, the appetite, uh, the, the appetite core, as you can see on that, on that sketch, because, I mean, it would be possible to have two different phases, let's say, separated phases. And that makes sense in the, in the field of uh, the biomineralization, in particular, in the, if, we, if you think about the, the nucleation. Uh, 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 ICP is proposed to be a, 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 a precursor of the apathetic phase. So we wonder if, okay, we detect two domains different, two phosphate domains, but is it really in the same grain or two different grains? And you can discriminate these two scenarios by using a different experiment based on the, on the, on the spin diffusion. So I do not uh, give so much details, but you can see that we see cross peaks between all the species that we have. So it means that all that species are in a single grain, actually in a single platelet. So now we are pretty sure that we have an apathetic core and the hydrophilic surface layer on the top. So we can also uh, investigate the composition, can prove that we have some hydrogen phosphate ions in the structure. Um, I will not go into details also, but we can measure the distance between the phosphorus and the hydrogen, and that distance corresponds to, a, to a, uh, an hydrogen phosphate ion. But it's quite interesting here because we can demonstrate this presence without any chemical shift consideration, just by measuring a distance. We can investigate the presence also of carbonate, calcium also, but not directly on bone because the natural abundance is too low in that case, so we use biometric samples. But anyway, we finally end up with this kind of model, which is in a way very similar to that, uh, the model proposed by uh, Christelle this morning. So, platelets with a crystalline apatitic core surrounded by an hydrated amorphous layer mainly composed of divalent ions, so hydrogen, calcium, carbonate and water, of course. So, at, uh, at that point, we, we had to think about, okay, so we have nice results with NMR, but we had to think about the uh, let's say, a putative role in vivo. I mean, what's the, what could be the, 
the interest to have such an hydrated layer on top of the of the platelets. So Crystal told us about uh, the fact that the ions at the surface, the hydrated layer, are very labile, so they act as an ion reservoir. They are able to balance the serum composition. But we thought also about a putative, let's say, structural role. So to check that, <coughs> we turn to a uh, cryo-TM experiment. So we try to observe the behavior of the platelets in the presence of water. So we started with the biomimetic uh, powder first. It was quite uh, um, simple in, a, in, a, in the first step. So prepare water suspension of particles, take a drop, put the drop on a grid, then put the grid in liquid ethane, and it allows the formation of amorphous ice, which uh, is transparent to the electron beam, and that's uh, typically what we get, the kind of picture that we have. It's a team, the, so cryo TM image. So you can see that we have, uh, let's say, a largely aggregated particles, which is not quite surprising because we deal with hydrophilic particles. But if you are looking at precisely some arrangement here of particles, you will see that these arrangements actually are oriented. So here is a zoom of the particles. So here, for example, <coughs> these arrangements are interesting in the sense that they are organized on the uh, laterally, let's say. There is stacking of particles, between 20, 30 particles sometimes. That's very regular. In between the each particles, we have a layer of around one nanometer. Sometimes you have bigger uh, assemblies. So the size of the particles are around, let's say, 30 nanometers. So it means that in this assembly, for instance, on the, on the, on the lengths, you have between three, four, five particles. And concerning the orientation, we observed the same preparation with, uh, by, by wax, so a diffraction in transmission mode between dry and the wet powder. And when going to the dry to the wet, we see a, a slight elongation of the OO2 reflection, meaning that the orientation of the platelets is probably in the C-axis direction in the similar way that we observe in bone. So that was for, let's say, tiny particles. So um, with bigger particles, if we take time to, um, let's say, let the time to, to the particles to, to assemble, we can assemble much more bigger, uh, uh, can have much more bigger assemblies and be bigger particles, even if the, uh, the, the packing is quite loose, that's less regular, let's say. In dry conditions, so without any water, standard TM, we do not see such um, typical organization, except in some very tiny zones, actually. And the majority of the platelets, they stay flat on the grid. So it seems that we need some water to, uh, let's say, to, uh, to give cohesion of the system. So we need the hydrated layer and we need the water. So if we want to prove that, we have to check some particles without any hydrated layer. So once again, we had a look to the stoichiometric appetite. So nothing special in cryo-TM, nothing special in wax, but actually it's not platelets. So we had to, let's say, keep the same morphology. Try to get some samples without any hydrated layer, but <coughs> platelets with the same size. So it's quite, that's quite difficult, that's quite tricky, actually. So we tried several, let's say, post-synthetic treatment to remove or, or, or to change, to modify the surface, change the properties. So we tried thermic treatment, chemical treatment. We find some, some good uh, conditions. And in these conditions, uh, you see that we have a strong reduction of the adsorption capability of the, of the particles. <coughs> and once treated, we don't see not so much uh, uh, um, specific oriented arrangements. So and in wax, again, no specific orientation. So final step now, try to, to look at directly bone mineral. Even if it's not so easy, because when you extract the bone crystals with a chemical treatment, you don't know if you preserve the mineral, you preserve the surface. You don't know if you modify the properties of your surface. So we used, uh, let's say, um, 
a standard procedure from the literature using sodium uh, hypochlorite. Well, it's not so impressive, but in the case of standard TM conditions, you, are, you have some, let's say, aggregation of the crystal, but some also flat crystals. And in case of cryo-TM, we do observe also some aggregation, oriented aggregation. If in that case it's true, we cannot, um, let's say, um, avoid putative presence of some organic residues that could uh, kept, you know, the, the particles stuck together. Well, so uh, as a conclusion, that's quite interesting to notice so that we are able to organize some particles, biomimetic particles, without any organic additives, in the same way that the, the, in the, same, the same way that the particles are organized in bones. So this is a quite EM picture of biomimetic particles. This is the a thin section of bone observed by TM, and you see that it's more or less the same kind of, uh, of arrangement. Of course, in the case of bone, the arrangement uh, um, is on a larger scale because you have the, the collagen scaffold that gives you the, 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 so the, the, a template for a large arrangement of the, of, the, of the particles. But what is interesting in our case is that the, the, the orientation of the platelet was described to be uh, driven by some uh, non-collagenous proteins. For, in, for in one example, the MP1. But without any organic additives, you can also uh, uh, assemble the platelets in the C axis direction. So we think that maybe the, the, the interaction of water with the specific domain, with the surface domain, gives you some cohesion of the, of the um, cohesion to the system. So, how to say? improve the, 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 the mechanical properties of the, of the system. So, I uh, would like to acknowledge the person who worked with us. In particular, uh, Gérard Peau for the CryoTM pictures, Mohamed Selman, Francisco Fernandez and Sophie Cassagnon, and I thank you, of course, you, for your attention. Mm -hmm.